This afternoon, we are very pleased to have some of those youth here today to present to you their speeches that they already have given at a club level, district level, and then they all moved forward into the Southern Regional Competition. And they had uh, done very well winning at those levels. So this afternoon, this segment, first off, will become part of the youth segment. So my part here is to introduce you to someone that you actually did get a chance to see here momentarily this morning. I am going to introduce you to our key member for the Southern 4-H Region Lethbridge District, Mr. Calvin Holthy, and he is going to lead you through the first segment of 4-H speakers this afternoon. So welcome, Calvin. Hello, I'm Calvin Holthy. Um, just quickly a little more about myself. I'm 16 years old. I'm the key member for the Lethbridge District, like Din Ginny said. The previous year, I was actually key member for the Tabor District. Uh, I'm in two 4-H clubs, the TNT Multi Club in Coaldale, and also the Retlaw Prairie 4-H Club in Retlaw. I've been involved in 4-H for eight years. So our first speaker presentation, I guess, is an intermediate presentation by Paige Reimer. She is from the 40 Mile District. Uh, her speech is called the Cattle Whisperer. She is 15 years old, and this is her sixth year in 4-H. Uh, she's in the Short Grass 4-H Beef Club. So please welcome Paige Reimer, the Cattle Whisperer. You have probably heard of a dog whisperer and a horse whisperer, but today I'm going to teach you how to become a cattle whisperer. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson and ladies and gentlemen. Come late fall every year is an exciting time for all beef 4-Hers because it's time to pick your 4-H steer. But it can also be a challenge to have to haul to break a different calf again. Fortunately, I have some helpful pointers to make that process easier. First things first, you have to know how to pick the right animal. Usually, the temperament of your steer comes from the bull. The mannerisms or the behavior of the steer are learned from the cow. For example, if the cow and bull are both high strung and aggressive, then the steer will also be aggressive and more difficult to work with. If you do not know the specific breeding of your 4-H steer, then a general guideline is to observe its mannerisms and look at the hair whirl on the forehead. Confused? Let me explain. The hair whirl, which is a circular growth of hair on the forehead of a calf, can often be an indicator of temperament. If the swirls are higher up on the calf's forehead, then the animal is usually high strung. But if the swirls are lower down, then the calf will most likely be calm. Within the first two weeks of picking your steer, it is necessary that he become familiar with you. The easiest way to do that is just sit down in the pen and let them come to you. Steers are curious by nature and will eventually come up and sniff you. When your steer does come up to you, make slow movements. Do not startle him and do not chase after him if he walks away. Leave on a positive note so the calf has a good memory of you when you come back. When it's time to introduce the curry comb, do so in the chute. There, the calf won't run away and he will learn how the curry comb feels and that it will not harm him. Then, let him go out of the chute, once again leaving on a positive note. Next time you go to curry him, start at the back or other common sweet spots on the calf, such as the tail head, or the top line. You will notice that your calf has begun to relax and gain your trust when they start to lick their lips and move their head up and down while you curry them. 
Once your calf has gained your trust and has become calmer, it is time to learn how to place the halter on your calf and how to remove it properly. Make sure your rope halter is in good repair and that is not torn or frayed. You also want a long shank for training purposes. Start by taking the halter and placing it over the calf's ears. Then slip it over the calf's nose. You then tighten the shank. You then slightly pull on the shank to tighten it. After the halter is securely on, making sure the shank is on the left side. Let your calf go and leave the rope to drag. This is because when your calf steps on the rope, he'll feel constriction and he'll not be able to move, which will teach him to obey the halter. Only leave the halter on for approximately half an hour, just to get them used to the feeling of it and never leave them unsupervised. To take the halter off, place your calf in the chute, loosen the shank, slip it over the ears and let it drop over the calf's nose. After you've let your steer walk around with a halter on a couple times, you can now begin to work at leading your calf. Ideally, when you begin training your calf to lead, it is a good idea to put him in a small round pen. This time, after you've let your calf out of the chute, and once he has settled down, you will slowly walk up to him and put your foot on the extra shank lying on the ground. Slowly, you will bend down and grab the rope so you do not startle your animal. After you've picked it up, make your way closer to him until you're standing beside his shoulder. Once you're beside your calf, you can slowly begin to scratch him. After your calf is relaxed and not so tense, the, drop the halter and walk away, once again leaving on a positive note. I'll now demonstrate. You will step on the, sh you will step on the halter and then slowly bend down to pick it up. You then will slowly make your way over to your calf. Once you're at its shoulder, you can scratch him. When you first begin leading your calves around, you'll notice that your calf is either a runner or a staller. If your calf is a runner, place him in a round pen, do the same steps in order to get hold of the rope halter, and if he runs, you'll be in the middle and he'll just run around you. You will soon learn that he can get away from you or the rope halter. If he's a staller, it is helpful to have someone walk behind your calf while you're leading him to twist his tail to help him keep moving. The proper way to twist a calf's tail is to grab it near the top and twist it up. As soon as a calf takes a step, it is important to let go of the twisted tail. Once he takes a step, he'll be rewarded with the pressure being taken off his tail. You'll want to repeat this until your steer follows you without stalling repeatedly. Always remember that when working with cattle, to stay calm and have slow movements. Do not hit your animal with a stick or a pipe. It will only teach your animal to fear you, and you will end up bruising some of the prime cuts on the carcass. The other important step in halter breaking your steer is to tie him up to a post. Lead your steer over to the post. Wrap the shank twice around the post and complete a normal slip knot to tie up your steer. At first, your steer will pull back on the rope. But as time goes on, he will learn to step forward in order to take the pressure off. You can curry him at this time to help him relax. To recap, when picking your steers, consider genetics and behavior to assess his temperament. Allow your animal to become familiar with you in a calm environment. Always put the halter on properly and work in a small round pen. Whether your calf is a runner or a staller, practice is the best way to get him to lead. In the end, you want your steer to trust you, not fear you. There you have it. You now know how to become a cattle whisperer. My resources for my presentation were Livestock and Handling for Youth Workshop and the Colorado State University website. This now concludes my presentation. Thank you, Paige, for your presentation. I should maybe try some of those pointers sometime. I would now like to introduce 
our next speaker, Carter Nickel, Danger Zone. This is his junior speech. Uh, Carter is 12 years old, and this is his fourth year in the Wild and Woolly 4-H Beef Club, 4-H Club. And he has a market lamb project. I'll introduce Carter Nickel, Danger Zone. Hurricanes, bear attacks, poisonous snakes, tornadoes, or avalanches could all be considered danger zones. I'm guessing you would not think of relaxing at a sandy white beach as part of a danger zone. Well, you should. Mr. Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, the ocean has its own danger zones. Big, deadly sharks. Now, which is the most deadly of them all? There are about 375 species of sharks. Many experts claim to say that the bull shark is the most deadly, followed by its two close cousins, the great white and the tiger shark. These three species are most likely to attack humans. Bull sharks get their name from their short, blunt snout, grumpy personality and tendency to headbutt their prey before attacking. Now you've probably thought that your parents could get grumpy, but that's nothing compared to a head-butting bull shark. Bull sharks are medium-sized sharks with thick stout bodies and long pectoral fins. They are gray on the top and white below and have black tips on their fins, especially when they are young bull sharks. In the wild, a bull shark can live up to 16 years. Males are approximately seven feet tall and can weigh up to 200 pounds. That's taller than many NBA basketball players. Now a female bull shark can be up to 11 feet and weigh up to 500 pounds, almost doubling the height and weight of a male. That's nothing I would want to come face to meet face to face with. Bull sharks can be found in warm waters all over the world. What's interesting about the bull shark is they're not just found in the ocean. In fact, they can be found far from the ocean. It's only one of the two species that can live in fresh water. The other is the rare river shark. Picture this scene. You're, it's a breezy, sunny day, and you're wading in the cool, shallow waters of the Mississippi River somewhere inland, like Missouri. And you look upstream, and a seven-foot bull shark is swimming your way which looks like a smile on his face. I think I'll be a little more careful when I'm playing in the shallow waters. The bull's hunting technique is known as the bump and bite. This means they will headbutt their prey before sinking their very sharp, triangular, serrated teeth into it. If you're scuba diving and you get bumped by a bull shark, you're in trouble. Bulls hunt in the murky water to make up for its poor vision. Like other sharks, they're able to find their prey with their keen sense of smell. Sharks have many teeth and can shed up to 35,000 teeth in their lifetime. They tend to hunt in shallow shoreline waters where people often, where pe people often like to swim. Humans are not part of a, nor of a bull's normal prey, but they'll eat almost anything. Their main diet consists mostly of fish. They also sometimes eat sea turtles, dolphins, and even other sharks. They're also not afraid to pick on somebody their own size or even larger. The fierce and deadly bull shark is nothing I would want to meet with. How about you? Next time you're planning your vacation, be careful. You might enter the danger zone. Thank you, Carter. That's why my family doesn't travel much. We like to stay at home. Uh, I will now like to introduce our senior presentation led by Anka Hermes. Uh, her presentation is called Anne Frank. Anka is 17 years old and has been in 4-H for seven years. Uh, she is in the South Country 4-H Judging Club and the Bro Bow River Riders 4-H Horse Club. Uh, again, Anka Hermes and Frank. On her 13th birthday, Anne Frank received a diary. 
Little did she know that only in a few weeks, her life would go under a complete change. And for more than two years, she will record everything that is happening around her. She also didn't know that her story would be heard by millions. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson and ladies and gentlemen. Two years ago, my family and I traveled to the Netherlands where my mom and I went to Amsterdam. One of the places we visited was the Anne Frank Museum. The Anne Frank Museum is a building where eight Jewish people lived for two years in hiding from the Nazis during World War II. The lineup outside was huge and we had to wait for about an hour. Around us, we heard a lot of different languages. As we entered the lobby area where you bought your tickets, the room was quiet. The atmosphere was very respectful. As we were paying to enter the house, there was information booklets there. They'd take you through the house explaining what happened in which room and who lived in that room. When you turn the corners of the warehouse, you see a worn out bookcase with some old artifacts still inside. The small bookcase had three shelves in it, which made it extremely small. Being teased about my height all the time, I thought it wouldn't be that small for me. But yet even I had to duck to not hit my head. After the bookcase, there's a small staircase and then you enter the hiding space. The windows in the house are all tinted so that nobody would suspect anything from the outside. From the staircase, you can also see the bathroom, which is extremely small. It holds a toilet and a sink. The eight people had a time schedule that allowed each member to wash themselves. Between 9 and 9.30, it was Anne's turn when she went through her intensive beauty schedule. Even though they were in hiding, Anne tried to do everything a normal girl would do. Because nobody can know that the families are hiding, the bathroom cannot be flushed since it could be heard by the workers in the warehouse. From the staircase, you then enter the Frank bedroom and living room. The family smuggled some of their old furniture into the small hiding spot so they could be as comfortable as they can. The living room was a place where Edith can catch up on her English reading, Marco can study for school, and Otto can read some of his favorite books. Walking in the living room, you see, a sm you see the wall with some lines and numbers on it. While in hiding, Otto and Edith kept track of their daughters' height. Next through a door is Anne Frank's room, which is first shared with Marco, her sister, and then later with Fritz Pfeffler, who joins the family. He is a Jewish dentist from down the street. The small room with green walls was barely big enough for a bathroom, let alone a two-people bedroom. My room fits a closet, desk, queen-size bed, small table, dresser, and couch. Anne's room had two simple single beds with pictures on the wall from a magazine. Up a stairs and through another door is a room equipped with a sink and a stove, so it is just appropriate to call that the most common living area. The von Pels family, consisting of August, Herman, and Peter, came into contact with the Frank family when Otto's business, Opectka, needed help. Opectka specializes in making jams from fruit and water. Since fruit is hard to come by in the winter, Otto needed Herman's expertise in spices. The families became very close and therefore went together in hiding. The whole house members get together in this particular room for a hot meal at noon. Food is scarce, and most often the only thing to eat is potatoes and vegetables. But when the food coupons ran out, so did the food. Often the family got no food or the same thing day after day. In her diary, Anne Frank was writing about a particular day that there was rotten food nearby, and to not make herself sick, she had to hold a handkerchief over her mouth and nose. I couldn't imagine going through that, since my life is so different. Through the Von Pels kitchen and bedroom, you can access Peter Von Pels' room. His room has a staircase in the middle of the room leading up to the attic. The 15-year-old boy gets a couple of pictures from Anne to put up on the wall from the magazine. The attic is a large storage area where the food is placed. It is usually a colder temperature there, but Anne loves to sit there and think by the big window. From the window, a large chestnut tree is seen. After you have finished the tour of Anne Frank's life during hiding, you go through a hallway to the adjoining house that was bought for museum purposes. In this house, you travel downwards to go back to the streets of Amsterdam. The first room explained what happened on August 4th, 1944, when everyone's worst fear came true. The eight victims are discovered through an anonymous tip that arrived early in the morning at the police office. The people in hiding are arrested and are taken for interrogation to a jail run by the Germans. Miep Hees and Beb Foskal, two of the helpers that helped out, were left behind. 
they took Anne's diary from the hiding spot. Since the Germans cleaned out the hiding spot after the Jews' arrest, Meep and Beb quickly searched the place. The two ladies found the red diary, along with loose paper sprawled out on the floor. In a panic, they grabbed everything and went back to the warehouse. Meep kept the diary in her desk. On August 8, 1944, the eight people in hiding are taken to Camp Westerbullock, which is located northeast of the Netherlands by passenger train. There, they were split into gender barracks where they worked mainly by cutting open batteries. On September 2nd, 1944, the eight were transported to go further east to Camp Auschwitz, which was a horrible three-day trip. When they got there, doctors rushed to examine all the people. Children, sick, or the elderly were sent to the gas chambers and never seen again. The eight people passed the exams by the doctors and were once again set, uh, split into gender barracks. This is the last time Otto Frank sees his wife and daughters. The men went to a separate barrack than the women and are forced to work hard. Most die of disease and exhaustion, but weighing less than 115 pounds while he weighed 150 before, Otto Frank manages stay, to stay alive during these horrible conditions. The women who had to work hard hauling heavy stones or grass mats managed to stay together for a small a period of time. Edith, Marco, and Anne Frank are assigned to the same barrack. Auguste von Pels is most likely sent to a different part of camp. In the winter of 1944, the Nazis decided to take as many working and healthy prisoners back to Germany. In a matter of days, the young girls were crammed in, into another freight train to the lo new location of Bergen-Belsen. Edith is left behind because she falls ill. She dies on January 6, 1945. After another awful journey of three days, the girls arrive at Bergen-Belsen. At the end of November, another load of prisoners arrive. Among these prisoners is Auguste von Pels. The girls in Auguste are reunited again, though after a few months she must leave again to another camp. Through transport, she is murdered. Bergen-Belsen gets worse and worse. There is no food and the sanitary conditions are dreadful. Margot and Anne Frank come down with typhus, which is a disease spread by lice or fleas. They both die just a few weeks before the rest of the people are sent home. After Otto Frank's long journey home, he had already heard about his wife's death. However, he still had hope for his daughters. His first goal when he got back to Amsterdam was to find Meep and Bep, since he had no home left for himself. While he was staying there, he did his best to find his daughters. On July 18, 1945, he finds out about his kids' final moments of life. It takes the mourning father three days to tell his family and friends about the news. After Otto tells Meep about his daughters, she gives him Anne's diaries and papers. When she hands the diaries to him, she said, here's your daughter Anne's legacy to you. After the war, Otto Frank devotes himself to working for human rights and respect. He answers thousands of letters from people about the diary, which is published on June 25, 1947. On May 3, 1960, Otto attends the opening of the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. On August 19, 1980, Otto dies peacefully in Basel, Switzerland. As we were leaving the museum, I looked back and really realized how small it was. Truthfully, I thought the museum was extremely boring, and I was fo forced to go there through my mom and aunt. Since I had only heard about Anne Frank, she really didn't mean anything to me. Now, however, I wish I could go back to experience it differently. After all the research that I have done, I have now realized how easy my life really is and that I need to be more grateful for everything that I have. At the time, Anne Frank had no idea about the impact she would make in the world by doing what she, what she loved, which was writing. I'm glad that I am now one of the million people that now know Anne Frank's story. I got all of my information from the official Anne Frank website, A History for Today, The Anne Frank Diary, and Personal Experience. Thank you.